Chapter 5 Two more days of traveling brought the people to their destination in the vicinity of Box Butte, where it was planned that they would remain for a time before going into winter quarters, so as to enable the men to hunt deer. Box Butte was well named. It was a solitary rectangular elevation, rising tall and clear above the surrounding land, so prominent that on clear days it could be seen two or three days' journey away. The land south of it, where the camp circle was to be made, was smooth and appeared to be level, though in reality it sloped gradually toward the river that ran eastward on the south. It was an ideal campsite, offering the three resiquits for a camp circle. Thick grass for the horses, and plenty of wood and water for the people. Farther to the south, beyond the river, were other buttes, shaped like, like box butte, as nearly perfect rectangles as though they had been made with a rule, but smaller, each one curiously aloof from the rest. The hand that set them around had been guided with taste, you might say, all alike yet at the same time so scattered as to avoid monotony in a manner not to block out the landscape. One could see between and pass them into long distances. Men were grateful for that. It was good for the eyes to look long distances occasionally. As soon as their teepees were up, the small hunting parties of congenial companions began radiating from the circle into the wild country further out. For Bluebird and Rainbow, this was their marriage trip as well. They expected to be away many days and to return with enough meat to supply their immediate relatives, the family of Rainbow's parents and his sisters, First Woman and Dream Woman. As a courtesy to their new relative, Bluebird's mother-in-law and two sisters-in-law had prepared everything for her trip and packed the small travel teepee and other camping needs on the Travioy's port platform behind the horse that dragged the poles. Bluebird rode that horse while Rainbow rode a faster one, though he held it in check to the pace of the more plodding pack horse so that the two might ride side by side and accustom themselves to each other. At intervals, Rainbow rode out for a quick survey of what lay ahead before they came to it. All travelers did this as a precaution. Bluebird had no idea where they were going, but her new husband had in mind just the place. His people had returned to this campsite regularly every two years, as far back as he could remember, and he and other youths had often explored the surrounding country. He had in mind a certain spot, hidden down a valley close to a stream. It was always peaceful there, and solitary. It would be an ideal spot for a tranquil stay. They would make their teepee under the tail cotton woods and watch the golden leaves glisten, glisten in the sunlight. Their only nature sounds would reach the ear, the murmur of the water, the twitter of birds overhead, the call of coyotes in the hills, all pleasantly new and wild. Back home, Water Lily did very well without her mother. Already she was used to playing in Little Chief's teepee, and now she slept and ate there. From now on, it was going to be as much her home as the teepee of her mother and new father. At night, she slept on a tiny pallet laid at a right angle across the head of the grandmother's bed, while her companion, Little Chief, who was now her brother, slept near his grandfather on the men's side of the teepee, beyond the central fire. At every meal, the grandmother served the children first, and then any adults present, including guests. It was the custom to put children first in all things. And as they ate, she gazed fondly on them and murmured from time to time, nearly unconsciously, Come now, grandchildren, eat. Eat so you may grow tall and strong. Eat first, then play. Water Lily was a roly-poly and needed no urging. But Little Chief, who was tending to slim down late of late, ate his meals desultorily. Often he forgot to eat at all remaining outside at play. This worried the grandmother Gloku, and she never missed a chance to speak of it so she could then explain it away. My grandson does not eat, though I urge and urge him. He is getting tall now, that is why. When children suddenly shoot upward, they will not eat, no matter what you say. I guess everyone knows that. This was purely in self-defense, for skinny children were a reproach to their parents. Women sometimes said of such a child, just look at him. Poor thing. He must have fathers and uncles who are stupid hunters or lazy. 
His women folk must be stingy with food. Ah, the poor child. She had said it to herself about other puny children. Now imagining it said about Little Chief made her uncomfortable. Water Lily was suddenly surrounded by so many new relatives, all making a fuss over her, that it was quite bewildering after a quiet life with only her mother in their teepee. But she soon took it in stride. From that day, when Little Chief came to visit her, the two children had been as devoted as though they were brother and sister, and now they really were that and it was no different. In spite of the gap in their ages, they always played happily together. Little Chief took much credit from the fact that Waterloo learned to walk under his tutelage, and now he was trying hard to teach her to talk. It was high time she did. Being nearly three winters old, yet she preferred to remain mute. The distressed, the distressed the boy greatly, and he complained to his grandmother I don't think my sister is ever going to talk. I think she's going to be like Inni doesn't speak. The old man who talk, who asked to talk with only his hands because he refused to learn when he was little. I don't know. I don't want a sister for that. You must be patient. Water Lily has a voice and she will talk soon. When she is ready, you shall see. No doubt she is teaching herself in her mind and trying out new words nobody can hear. She does not want to make mistakes and be laughed at. As in, as for Insni, he could not talk because he had no voice, his grandmother said to Little Chief. And she was right. Suddenly overnight, as it were, the child was talking, ghibli and well, to the surprise of everyone. Little Chief was triumphant. I guess she was learning in her mind all the while, when I pointed to you and said grandmother, and to the puppy and said dog, and to the pony and said horse. She was learning because I was teaching her. Yes, you were a good teacher, grandmother assured him. Goku was herself an excellent tutor. She had trained her own children well, so they had good manners and were respected in the tribe. Then she had helped with her grandchildren's training, and now she was starting again with Water Lily. The first thing to learn was how to treat other people and how to address them, she said. You must not call your relatives and friends by name, that for that was rude. Use kinship terms instead, and especially brothers and sisters. The boy cousins and girl cousins must be very kind to each other. That was the core of all kinship training. But Goku did not lecture all the time. Instead, she stated the rules of behavior towards one and another and pointed out examples. When the right opportunity came up, she never failed to take advantage of it. For example, there was a time during her mother's absence when Water Lily in high spirits flung a handful of dirt into Little Chi's face and was sharply corrected for it. They were playing with their cousins, Leaping Fawn and Prairie Flower, when it happened. Water Lily had meant no harm, certainly. She was only trying to be funnier than the rest, who were having a hilarious time of it. But when her grandmother spoke suddenly in warning, it frightened her, and she began to cry and scream in sympathy when she saw the tears streaming down her brother's face from the stinging hurt. No, no, don't do that, grandchild, ever again. It is not done. He is your brother. One must not hurt a brother. The severe words were entirely unexpected from the always gentle grandmother. But in after years, Water Lily could say that this was the only time she was stern with her. Turning to the boy, his grandmother said as sharply, Do not take on. Your sister meant no harm. You know that. She is too little to understand that it would hurt. See how your crying causes her to be unhappy? For shame. You should restrain yourself at all costs for a sister's sake, and for a girl cousin's too, she added. Might as well teach the whole lesson at once. You are big enough now to know what a brother does does not embarrass his girl relatives, but strives only to spare them and to make them happy. This I have told you often already. Now go and wash out your eyes. And so she settled the matter by first correcting the children and then explaining why. And then she took them to the creek to play, and soon they had forgotten the bad time and were happy together again. Both grandparents were patience and gentleness itself. 
All day long in the evenings, as long as they were alone, they humored the two children and bore their noisy play with unwavering affection in the selfless way of grandparents. But when company came, the situation was changed. The children set off to one side and played quietly there, as they had been told, so as not to, to disturb adult conversation. They learned to do this from one another, the younger ones copying the older ones. Children were not actually repressed, but they soon learned to repress themselves when they saw it was the approved way for them. If a little one in their group was too young to understand, the grown-ups always corrected the older children instead. That was the general practice. Lulu was especially skillful at this, and Little Chief learned to cooperate with her for Water Lily's sake. One evening, when there was an important man visiting the grandfather, Water Lily made a disturbance by laughing and screaming merrily at the shadow pictures the older children were making on the teepee wall to amuse her. Each time, the grandmother called to them gently, Play quietly, children, addressing them together as though she did not know where the fault lay. But when that did not suffice, she turned on Little Chief and deliberately blamed him. Water Lily was too little to be reprimanded yet, so he must take it for her. In time, when this happened often enough, she would realize and improve so as to spare her brother. In time, she would learn, and this was Grandmother's way of teaching her, by indirection. By examples of correction aimed at someone older who could take it. Play quietly, little Chief Gloku said. You know better than to laugh and scream when there are visitors. And what a racket you're making, anyway. Suppose we were in an enemy country where we were camping in. Suppose, supposing a scout were stealing up to our teepee in the dark. You should not be able, we should not be able to hear him for all the noise, and he could look in and count our strength. So play quietly now. Little Chief knew he did not deserve these rebukes, but he was used to the practice and knew why the grandmother employed it. Because he loved his little sister so very much, he was content to be scolded in her place. He simply lowered his voice to bear to a bare whisper, and when it came time to laugh, he put his hands over his mouth and went through the motions of keeping back a laugh that he would not permit to escape. But Water Lily met, went on noisily. It would take time. The child was humored all around. Her new aunt, Dream Woman, dropped all her work to make playthings for her, a little teepee and tiny bags and other furnishings such as a woman would own, perfect replicas and beautifully decorated with quill work that woman stopped to admire. The teepee was only as tall as the limb from her elbow to her fingertips, but still too much for Water Lily to manage. Leaping Fawn, who was older, set it up for her and placed the furnishings about inside, and the little people one finger long, made of skin. Dream Woman did things like that, quietly making her relatives happy and saying little. That was why she was named Dream Woman, because like one who dreamed or saw visions of beauty, then remembered them, she worked such designs as nobody else imagined or originated. Woman said she had supernatural help or she could not be so skilled in art, but that was, but as, but be that as it may, Dream Woman was not one to divulge any secrets, though she was often teased to say where she got her designs. And then one day the children went to pray. The evening before, Dream Woman, having already fed her family, came into her parents' teepee for a little while. They were eating still, but Water Lily was playing with her teepee and her little people, having, qu having quickly finished her supper. Little Chief had not yet come in from throwing rocks for a distance with other small boys back of the teepees, though his grandmother had called him several times. But after a little, he stood outside the doorway and called in, Grandmother, we can see a big man up there, a giant. Where is up there? Gloku asked. Come in and eat your supper while you tell us all about it. But I'm not hungry, Grandmother. And that giant is standing on the top of the butte over there at sunset end. The grandfather said, Nonsense, child. Even a giant way up there you could hardly make out from here. Better come in now. Maybe the giant is only some dirt on your lash. And he chuckled at his own jest. Dream Woman spoke up. I believe the pile of prayers up there is what my nephew sees. 
It is such a clear evening that everything is plain. I noticed how close Box Pewed seems as I came in. And that is what it was. When the boy came in, the grandfather explained it to him. Child, the power of prayers is holy. Ever since there were men, I suppose, he began. They have gone up there to pray, and have left their prayers in a great pile until now. It is much taller and bigger than any giant, and that is what you saw. A minute later, a thought struck him, and he turned to Gloku. Old woman, take them up there before we move away, the boy and his sister. It is everyone's right to relate himself to the great spirit. Let them do that and leave their prayers. What he said about Box Butte was entirely true. For Box Butte was a holy place, a shrine where people went to pray for all sorts of blessings, but mostly for a long, good life. Many made such prayers there and at other hallowed places. They regularly ended their prayers for all sorts of things with the same refrain, and great spirit, or grandfather, may I live long. For the Dakotas passionately loved life, while at the same time they met death without panic when it came. The day being pleasant and fair, right after the new meal, the grandmother packed some pemmican into a parchment bag and poured water into a skin container, saying to herself, The day is hazy and pungent with autumn smoke, very agreeable, not too hot or too cold. It is a good day to pray. We shall visit the holy hill. She called little chief in from play, telling him, Grandchild, as your grandfather said, we are going up there now indicating the direction with a characteristic lift of her chin toward it. You and your sister shall leave your very own prayers today. She handed them she handed him the water skin to carry, lifted water lily up onto her back and pulled her blanket up over her and drew it tight to hold her firmly in position there. Then she reached for the boy's free hand and they started out. It proved a considerable walk. Box spewed always so deceptive, seemed to move back constantly as they approached it. Occasionally, Gloku sat down to rest and let Water Lily down to play near her. Meanwhile, the boy darted about everywhere, expending his balanced energy recklessly, visiting now his rock and now that tree to see what was behind it and then racing back, only to dart away again. When his grandmother called that they must be off again, he skipped and bounced about continuously as though he got up and put Water Lily on the back once more. It is weary the grandmother just to watch him, and while he plodded up the steep ascent with the aid of her staff, he ran nimble as a mountain sheep, straight up to the tableland on top, and then came running down again to join her. This he did effort effortlessly two or three times. For Loku with the child on her back was hardly was was hard climbing, yet she would not think of putting Water Lily down. So used she was to carrying grandchildren on her back that she seemed a part of herself. At last they reached the top of the butte and sat down near the sharp rim of it. From there they traced the river winding its course toward the east, a shining streak that disappeared and reappeared through clusters of trees as they went. Where does it go, grandmother? On and on to where? Little Chief was always asking questions. She told him that by and by it would empty into the royal water, the Missouri, which men said was the chief of all rivers in the world. Beyond it, they could see many other buttes, like Box Butte, more and more people as they grew smaller and smaller. The further away, they were. Looking nearer, they saw their own camp circle in the foreground, going about its business, unaware of their watching from the high station. It was like a plaything, a miniature camp circle of little teepees, like water lilies, set in a ring, little men, little women, moving hither and yon like ants. Little horses in a scatter, feeding around the circle. They had climbed the south side about the middle of the butte. The pile of prayers was at the west end, the sunset end. But first they must have their lunch and drink their water. The grandmother touched the children's wrists and face with water to refresh them and patted some of it on the crown of their own head. Of Pimicon, one's own handful 
was one sufficiency, so rich and sustaining was it. Each one reached into the bag and came up with a handful of tawny stuff, which the grandmother had made that morning by parching some very dry jerked meat, then dampening it, and finally pounding it with her dull wooden mallet until it was light and fluffy as cotton. Come now, children, she said at last. We shall leave our food and water here till we come back. And so, with the grandmother holding each child by the hand, the three approached the shrine. Innumerable stones were there, of every size and description, each chosen according to the taste of the petitioner. Many were tiny pebbles, baby prayers. Here and there the stones were red with paint, some still vivid, others now dull. The rest had been washed clean of any point by snows and rains of many years. It was plain at last while Gloku had why Gloku had helped Little Chief to select a nice round stone on the way, all white and smooth to bring along. At the same time, she found one for herself and a very small red one for Water Lily that just fitted her palm. Near the pal, she sat down. At once, the little girl began backing up to sit on her lap as usual, but Gloku put her off gently. No, not now, grandchild. You and your brother sit there facing me, for I have something I must do. They watched her unfold a bit of painted deer skin and spread it out. It contained ceremonial red paint. With a little of it on her fingertips, she carefully painted each child's right palm. Before you hand a holy things, you must have sacred paint on your hand, she told them. Then she painted their stones and instructed them to place their prayers where they would stay. So, standing on tiptoe, they put them as high up the side as, as they could reach, fitting them into convenient spaces between the larger ones. Water Lily did not question anything and allowed the grandmother's hand to guide her, but little she found the whole procedure very bewildering. For never before had anything made his grandmother act so strangely, so solemn and so aloof that she could forget him. Nor could she tell from her face whether this was really in fun, after all, and not as so serious as she was making it. Unable to decide which it was, he prudently prepared for either, frowning a little while at the same time smiling cautiously as he placed his stone. His confusion only increased Gloku, turned abruptly away from the pile of prayers, and walked a few space paces south until she stood at the very edge of the butte, tall and straight, with her head tilted back a trifle, and her chest high, and her eyes fixed as though to something far, very far away, beyond the farthest butte. And then came the strangest moment of all. She was calling out to someone there, throwing her voice, half wailing, in a mighty prayer. Great mystery. See these little ones? They have become your relatives today. Treat them as such. Pity them. Be kind to them. Grant them to live long and good lives. Little Chief would never forget this, his grandmother's unusual behavior, her prayer in their behalf, and the way she remained standing a long time as if frozen, unaware of her surroundings, obl oblivious to the brisk wind that whipped her buckskin skirt smartly against her and blew her hair in her face, or to water lilies wandering off too far, or to Little Chief himself, staring in wonder up into her face. Something had surely come over his grandmother. But suddenly she seemed to snap somewhere and return to the immediate. Back at the pile of stone, she carefully painted her own. Her hands were red already and placed it near the top, being able to reach higher than even Little Chief. They returned to the spot where they had first rested and ate more pemmican and drank more water. Cloco remained sitting while the children played. Little Chief rolled rocks into space with all his might, thinking to hit the circle, the camp circle, maybe. Compassionately, Gloku watched the children. I have done all I can, she said. If they are to enjoy long life, that is up to the great spirit. As the sun lowered, the day grew cooler, and it was time to descend the butte and go back home. The children were reluctant to go, but soon after forgot about that. When they came, when they found that their parents had returned during their absence, bringing much food for feasting and for their winter's fare. 
and everyone was happy.